already here. And in this video, we are going to talk about what is a concept. Now we're going to approach it from various theoretical perspectives. Um, and I'd like to start off, want you to think about something. So if I asked you, what is a square? And what would you think? What would you say? You might say it's a closed four-sided figure composed of four straight lines of equal length, joined at 90 degree angles. And if you did that, that's a great definition. Again, we have to think about concepts in our mind as, you know, uh, kind of these um, abstract things, potentially. Um, and when you describe this abstract thing to me, uh, you talked about a set of features, right? So you identify the features uh, that a square must have. Um, and you kind of described all the features. Um, and that's really kind of how we talk about um, concepts, at least a classical approach, is talking about a set of features that are necessary and sufficient for uh, identifying the member of a category. And we can actually trace this research all the way back to classical Greek philosophers. You might have heard of them, like Plato and Aristotle. And again, um, it didn't really kind of come back or be generally uh, back into the public eye until about the mid 20th century. Um, you know, however, uh, once it became in vogue, psychologists really got into it and started to look at the classical approaches to what concepts are. Now, here's the problem. Let's say that we changed your example instead of a square, which is kind of, you know, you can think about it objectively in your head. What if I asked you what a game is? How would you describe it? Um, again, you would try to think of a definition, but it's harder because think about all the different kinds of games you played. Uh, maybe you're talking about a, I don't know, Risk or, or um, Connect Four or uh, Monopoly. These are all different types of games. So how do you describe it to me. How do you talk about it? You can't really uh, talk about it as a single definition that adequately captures everything like you could a square. Um, and now researchers uh, kind of looked at this and, and used this concept of a game as a theoretical argument against a definition approach to concepts. Uh, they argued that uh, it's not possible to identify a list of necessary and sufficient features for many categories in a real world situation. Because you would kind of have to think about what is common in board games. Um, and you would say, well, what's common to card games, baseball games, uh, video games, Olympic games, right? That's very hard. What features are common to them all? Um, and again, um, you might want to think of very some common features across. Maybe they're all competitive. You have winners and losers. There's something with luck involved or, or skill. Uh, they're usually fun and, and they have amusement. Um, I, I don't know. It gets challenging, especially when you think about when you were a kid. Maybe you played handball against your garage door or wall. Maybe you're playing by yourself, right? Is that competitive? Uh, are, are you even playing a game? Uh, and if you say yes, who are the winners and who are the losers? So uh, researchers argued that uh, against definition approach, again, saying it's more about categorical members that share what he called a family resemblance. So think about families and they share features, right? So if you look at parents and kids, they usually share similar features. He would say that's how concepts work as well. They share a sense of overlapping uh, similarities. Now we can even look at not only the theoretical arguments that were made, uh, but we can also look at the empirical findings that suggest the classical views of concepts uh, as definitions is incorrect. And again, one characteristic of the definition approach is that um, it determines whether something is part of a category. But once something is determined to be part of a categorical member, it does not make distinctions between categorical uh, members themselves. Uh, again, uh, researchers Mikulski and his uh, colleague demonstrated that a categorical boundaries are not always so clear cut. They presented their participants with pairs of words and the second word was a category name. The participants uh, task was to quickly judge whether the first word was a member of that category. Uh, for example, a dog, mammal, participant, uh, you know, so the participant should indicate yes if they saw like dog slash mammal. Their results indicated that for some items, this task was easy. 
Um, items where, where there are clear members, like chair furniture, yes. Or clear non-members, like cucumber furniture, no. However, some items were much more difficult, like bookcase furniture, curtains furniture. For these items, there was disagreement across participants, with some responding yes, others responding no, as well as within across uh, participants as well, or across different testing sessions, I should say. So the data suggests that we do not treat all members of category equally. Instead, we behave in, in, uh, some, in some way that we indicate that some members of a category are better than others. Like, for example, if I, I told you to take a minute and write down all the birds you can think of, chances are you wrote down birds like robin, blue jay, sparrow. Uh, again, where's ostrich? Where's penguin? These are all birds, but why are they at the bottom of your list? Um, and again, it comes back to maybe we consider some uh, items more typical uh, when we talk about birds, like a robin, than a penguin or an ostrich. Another approach to concepts is the prototype approach. Um, and again, um, we also kind of refer to this approach as the family resemblance or probabilistic approach. This approach views concepts as abstract representations, we call them prototypes, that summarize the common and distinctive attributes of the member of a category that comprise the concepts. The prototype of a category is essentially a weighted average of important features of its members. Important features are those, by the way, shared by the most common uh, members and not by the members of other categories. So there's common and then there's distinctive. Categorical membership is determined by virtue of the similarity of the object's attributes to the prototype attributes. So again, a prototype is just the idea uh, that concepts are represented based on a typical slash common instance uh, or concept. So you might have a prototype of a bird in your head and you might have similar features that you say a bird is and then you might have some that are not a bird. So you can think about those. The exemplar approach uh, proposes that concepts consist of separate representations of experienced examples of the category. In other words, categorization of an object is accomplished by comparing it to all your memories of similar things. So we think back to our game example. Suppose you open up a present and it's a colorful box containing some dice, a deck of cards, some plastic tokens, and a board, and a set of rules. Now these contents may bring your mind specific experiences that you've had with objects that are similar, like Monopoly, Candy Cane Lane, Risk, all the, some of the games I mentioned earlier. So that you would compare the memory of these objects with the new one in front of you and determine that it's a board game. The major difference between this approach and the prototype approach is that uh, comparisons are being made to memories of actual experiences rather than an abstract experience. So again, the exemplar approach is the idea that concepts are represented based on exemplars of a category that one has previously experienced. The other approach is the uh, word knowledge approach. And this is really about uh, goal-derived concepts. And we'll get into it in just a minute here. But categories of things are grouped together based on how well their members satisfy a particular purpose. So keep that in mind, goal-derived concepts. So goal-derived concepts are categories of things grouped together, not because of their shared observational features, but rather how well their members satisfy a particular purpose. Uh, and this researcher measured three variables, central tendency, it's essentially a measure of family resemblance, frequency of instantation, how often an item was considered a member of a category, and how well an item satisfied the goal, and he called this ideal. So these are the three uh, uh, things that this researcher said you had to consider when you talk about a concept, which was central tendency, frequency, and the ideal. Uh, his results indicated that all three variables were important to determine an item's um, typicality. Because the exemplar and prototype approaches depend on observable features, the findings of an abstract feature like goal directedness, the ideal, is problematic for those approaches. Results like this have led some theorists to develop an approach 
in which conceptual structures are part of a larger system of uh, general knowledge. Stored network approaches really talked about how ideas uh, uh, are stored as hierarchies and they're stored in memory as network of relationships. And really, it kind of talks about uh, what they call the cognitive economy. And it talks about how concepts uh, of information are stored in the most efficient level of a hierarchy. And you can get into subordinate concepts and uh, superordinate concepts. Um, but I'm going to leave it here. But it's really about how we conceptualize and think about things in the form of concepts. Now, an alternative to the stored network view is that hierarchical relationships are computed using reasoning processes rather than being directly stored in semantic network. So the previous theory talked about how concepts are stored in a semantic network. In this approach, deciding how concepts are related involving, well, it involves comparing features of two concepts. So you would think about it. So if you were kind of ran into a tapir, which is like a, 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 um, a pig-shaped mammal found in the southern hemisphere of the world, you would kind of think about the features and you would say, is this an animal? Does it reach my animal uh, concept in my head, right? You would say, can it move? Does it have skin, eyes and ears and a mouth? And then you would say, yeah, it's an animal, right? So that would help you kind of categorize it. So you're comparing the features and concepts rather than just processing a, a directly stored semantic concept. The next most exciting approach is the neuroscience approach. And this really looks at where concepts are stored in the brain. So we try to link up these uh, ideas of concepts and where specific brain regions where these might be stored in memory. Uh, now, I think this is a very fascinating and future direction of the field. Uh, if you get a chance, get some neuroscience books, take a neuroscience course. Uh, but with that said, I think that is it for this video. I will see you all next time. Like, subscribe, and share. And I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Take care.